and welcome to our special online service for Palm Sunday. We're so glad that you've joined us today. I want to let you know about a couple of things as our service gets started. First of all, we would love to connect with you today and you can do that by filling out our online communication card. Just go to bearvalleychurch.com connect. Let us know that you're watching today and let us know if there's a way we can be praying for you this week. We also hope that you'll join us next Sunday for Easter Sunday worship. We've got three worship services going on. We'll have our sunrise service in person in our outdoor pavilion at 6.33 in the morning. And we'll also have our regular worship services at 10 o'clock and 11.15. Uh, we'll have Bear Valley Kids, uh, kids programming for both of those services as well. So we hope that you'll join us either online next Sunday or we'd love to see you in person as well. And now let's continue in worship. Grace, what have you done? Murdered for me on that cross Accused in absence of wrong My sin washed away in your blood Too much to make sense of it
Today is Palm Sunday, the day that inaugurated the final week in Jesus' life. And what a week! A lot can happen in seven days. In fact, I think it could be said without question that the final week of Jesus' life is the most important week in the history of our whole world. Time Magazine did a study of who is the most influential person in all history. They use the same concept of algorithms that Google uses, computational data-centric analysis. And who came out number one? Well, it's no surprise that Jesus came out on top. In fact, number two came in about a thousand points back, Napoleon. Well, Palm Sunday, here's what happened on Palm Sunday. I'm going to read from the book of Luke about how this whole thing uh, came down. Beginning at verse 35. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw some of their clothing across his back for Jesus to sit on. Then the crowd spread out their robes along the road along uh, ahead of him. And as they reached the place where the road started down from the Mount of Olives, the whole procession began to shout and sing as as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles that Jesus had done. God has given us a king, they exalted. Long live the king. Let all heaven rejoice. Glory to God in the highest heavens. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Sir, rebuke your followers for saying these things like that. He replied, If they keep quiet, The stones along the road will burst into cheers. But as they came close to Jerusalem and he saw the city ahead, he began to cry. Eternal peace was within your reach and you turned it down, he wept. So why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come to this earth? Why did he show up on Palm Sunday in Jerusalem and come triumphantly into the holy city? Why did he die? Why was he resurrected? Let's take a look at some of the reasons why. That's what we're going to look at today. And so number one is to give us not just life on this earth, but also eternal life. Eternal life. How amazing. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, As it is written, it's in Isaiah, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. One week after Palm Sunday was Resurrection Sunday, Easter. And the resurrection changed everything. It changed the world. And the world took notice. 
<laughs> what, what year were you born? Well, if it's 1980 or 1950 or 2000, that's how many years there have been on this earth since Jesus. The world has changed since Jesus showed up. The resurrection proved that Jesus was who he said he was. Jesus had made some startling statements, and the most startling one of all was this, I am God. <laughs> now, who would ever say that? A good teacher would never say that. And then he said, and because I'm God, if you kill me, I'll rise again in three days. Those are pretty big words, right? And he did it. Imagine the Romans, what the Roman soldiers were thinking. You know, how do we get rid of this guy? We've never had anybody show up again after being executed. If the resurrection had not happened, we would have never heard of Jesus. He would have just been another in the long line of rabbis that nobody's you know, ever heard of. But he did it. He rose again. He paid the price for our sins so that we could have eternal life, not just a good life on this earth, but also the life beyond the grave. That's why he came. Recorded in, in John 11, Jesus then said, I am the one who raises the dead to life. Everyone who has faith in me will live, even if they die. And if everyone who lives because of faith in me, they will never really die. Do you believe this? So, do you believe it? Number one, not just to give us life on this earth, but also eternal life. Let's look at another reason that Jesus came from heaven to earth. Number two, to give us a clear conscience. To give us a clear conscience. Some people have suggested that even if there were no heaven, it would be worth it to become a believer in Christ, if for no other reason than to gain a clear conscience. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? You know, when you get a traffic ticket, you have to pay a fine. And once you pay, justice is served. So here's what Jesus did. He died on the cross to pay for everyone's sins. And when he died, justice is served. Jesus said something remarkable. He, he told a man that his sins were forgiven. Now, if a guy hurts you, you can forgive him. But if a guy hurts someone else, how can you forgive him on behalf of another? But that's exactly what Jesus has done. He didn't just say our sins were forgiven. He paid the fine. He paid the price, which in this case was death on a cross, so that our sins could be fully paid for. Acts 10.43 reads, He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in Him will have their sins forgiven through His name. Every person you know, has secret guilt, has secret regrets. Every person has secret shame. And Jesus came to set you free. Some of you probably think that there's some sin that you committed or that was committed against you that sort of disqualifies you from ever having a happy, abundant life with God. But I've got some good news, some good news for you. If you'll devote your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He'll forgive you right now and begin the process of redeeming your sin and redeeming your pain. Number three, Jesus came to bring reconciliation. God created Adam and Eve to live in perfect friendship with Him. But, but once they sinned, once they went their own way, humanity was at odds with God. There was a separation between God and humanity. And so Jesus came to end the separation. Jesus came to close the gap. Jesus came to reconcile us to the Father. It's in Romans 5.10 where it says, For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Jesus knew that the only way we could be reconciled to the Father would be to have a perfect lamb die to pay the price for the sins of the world. And Jesus was that lamb of God. He gave His life that we might be reconnected with God. And because we're reconciled to God, we can be reconciled to each other. If people, if we just focus on our differences, we'll always find ways to be disconnected from one another. But in Christ, we have the most important thing of all in common. We are all part of the body of Christ. Therefore, we have the potential, the possibility of being reconciled to anyone. Since Jesus is in my heart and Jesus is in your heart, thus we can always find some common ground. Jesus came to bring us reconciliation, reconciliation with the Father and with others. Well, let's look at number four. So we can be close to God. 
He came so we can be close to God. Jesus made this cryptic statement to the crowds at the temple. He said, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. The, the temple was the centerpiece of the Hebrew religion's rituals. And once a year, a special sacrifice was made of a sacrificial lamb, and the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to actually commune face to face with the living God. And, and they had an interesting tradition. They tied a rope onto the leg of the high priest just in case he died in there in the Holy of Holies so that they could pull him out without having to enter it themselves, which they feared that they would die. But now the scripture says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place, the Holy of Holies, because of the blood of Jesus. Now we can be close to God ourselves. We don't have to wait for some holy man to be close to God, and then maybe we can be close to the holy man. God has invited us into the Holy of Holies ourselves. The temple was the geographical center of the Hebrew faith. But there is no geographical center of the Christian faith. It's not Jerusalem. It's not Rome. The center of the Christian faith is Jesus himself. And we can be friends with Jesus. We can be close to God. We can have a personal friendship relationship with the creator of the universe. We can know him. We can love him. We can be close to him. That's why Jesus came. And Jesus also came to set us free. We can be free. Now, what does it mean to be free in Christ? Let me just suggest several things. It means that we can be free from the rules that we thought bound us to Christ. We can be free from having to fit into the world's mold. We can be free from the manipulation of other Christians that they use to try to make us to be like them. We can be free from the fear of rejection and guilt, free from the fear of death, free from wearing masks and trying to impress people. We can be free from trying to act like something we aren't. It's okay to be just like you are. You can't be anything else. We can be free to doubt, free to risk, free to question. We can be free to follow the Lord, not because we have to, but because we want to. Free from the law. The Christian faith is a relationship, and relationships can only develop in a wholesome way, in freedom. A forced relationship is no relationship worth having. Let's look at a sixth thing. Jesus also to show us, Jesus came to show us, to reveal to us our purpose. If you don't know your purpose for living, where are you going to find it? Will you ask yourself, like, hello self, why am I here on this earth? It seems to me that the way to find your purpose is to ask the one who made you. The person who can tell you why you're here is the person who is your creator. This is how Ephesians um, 111 reads in the message paraphrase. It's in Christ that we find out who we are. Who we are, that's our identity. And what we're living for, what we're living for, that's our purpose. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, He had His eye on us. He had His designs for us, for a glorious living, part of the overall purpose He is working out in everything and in everyone. That's what it says. Every day we continue to understand our purpose for living, but there is one overarching purpose that all of us have, and that is preparing for eternity. That's what we're supposed to be doing every day, preparing for eternity. That is the meaning of life. Well, let's look at number seven. Jesus came to give us supernatural strength for living. Now, here's the truth about our culture. It seems like everyone is like overstressed and overworked and overtired. This fast-paced world is doing a number on us. So, so we need to get plugged into God's power source. Paul prayed this. He said, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. It's the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. That's the power we have to live in this world. And so we can tap into His power and thank God for it. And we can celebrate it. So your life now can become a celebration. You see, you can spend your life just worrying about the future or celebrating what you already have in God now. You can spend your life wishing that you had other possessions or celebrating that you already have the greatest one, that's Jesus himself. You can spend your life feeling guilty over past sins or celebrating that all those sins have already been forgiven. You can spend your life thinking that you're not very important or celebrating that Jesus gave his life for you so you must be very important in the eyes of God. He's the one who matters. 
You could spend your life being unsure about the big decisions ahead of you or celebrating how God has helped you with every decision so far and you know He can be counted on for the future. You can spend your life wondering what if about a thousand things or celebrating that God is going to work out everything in your life for good even if you messed a lot of them up already. Let's look at number eight. Jesus came to defeat our greatest enemy, death. Here's what it says in Hebrews 2. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could He die. And only by dying could He break the power of evil who had the power of death. Only in this way could He set us set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Did you get that? Only in this way could He set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. There's so many things to fear in this life. Disease, war, pandemics, violence, depression. But the biggest fear of all is the fear of death. That ends it all. And Jesus came to take away the pain of death. The scripture says, oh death, where is your sting? Because in Jesus, death opens the door to heaven. We live for Jesus in this life, and then we're going to continue to live for Jesus in the next life. And that life will be even better. So in Christ, we can defeat our greatest enemy. Number nine, Jesus came to show us that the worst evil can be transformed into good. One of our favorite verses is Romans 8, 28. And we know that, all thing, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. This is one of the coolest things about Jesus coming into this world, that He can redeem the bad things in our lives and somehow bring good out of them. It doesn't say they are good, but He can bring good out of them. He can turn ashes into beauty. He can take evil that was done against you and by some miraculous pathway show that some good can be brought even out of that pain. The greatest example of, this, of the, that fact is Jesus Himself. The worst thing that ever happened in the history of this world was that our Savior was executed on a cross. But God transformed it so that the worst thing that ever happened turned out to be the best thing that ever happened in the world. Jesus took our guilt and nailed it on the cross so that we are free. Our sins have been forgiven. So what do you do? In response to this, what should you do? That brings us to number 10. Turn everything over to Jesus. Turn everything over to Jesus. Romans 10, 19, 10, 9 says, If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised Him from death, you will be saved. It means to trust Him. A relationship with God is not an act of doing good deeds to earn God's favor. It's, it's all by faith. It is putting your trust and salvation in Him, not in yourself, not in your good works, but in Jesus' one good work of dying on the cross to bring you salvation. After college, I went to graduate school for four years to get my master's degree and then seven more years to get my PhD. You'd think I'd be smarter by now, but I worked really hard to get an A in every class. So what Jesus does for those who receive him is this. He gives us an A in, in class, an A in advance. For all who give their lives to him, he gives an A in the class, an A in life. We don't have to earn the A with Jesus. It's a gift. He already gave it to us so that we can just enjoy our relationship with him in this life. The story of most of the people of Jerusalem was recorded for us in this passage we read about Palm Sunday. Quote, but as they came closer to Jerusalem, he saw the city ahead and he began to cry. Eternal peace was within your reach and you turned it down and he wept. They turned it down. They turned down the life that God came to offer. They missed it. But that doesn't have to be your story. Today can be a day when you find eternal life. If you've never prayed to receive Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord, or if you need to reaffirm your commitment to Him, I invite you right now to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, please come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. From this moment forth, I will live for you, and you will be the Lord and Master of my life. Thank you for coming into my heart today. Help me for the rest of my life to live for you. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, amen.